Hello. Today I'm going to be talking about the Nano Cryotron, which is a new three-terminal superconducting nanowire-based electrothermal device we've de been developing here at MIT, um, Professor Carl Berggren's group. Now, superconducting electronics in general have had a long history with a lot of, and currently they have a lot of diverse applications. You know, here you can see voltage standard done by NIST, the transition edge sensor. We use SNSPDs. Here's a qubit. Um, and they really, the field of superconducting electronics started out with this device, the Cryotron, which was a device, three, uh, four terminal device actually, that was based on two superconducting wires, one which was wrapped around the other. Now, uh, it was invented in the 1950s by Dudley Buck at MIT, and what the way these wires worked was current was pumped through the coiled wire, it would induce a magnetic field, and that magnetic field would suppress the superconductivity and the critical current of the through wire. You know, since then though, superconducting electronics have had a long history. There's been about 50 years of devices, you know, two, three, and four terminal devices. You can see a list here. I'll have a full reference available on the last slide. But the important thing to note really is that even in even though many of these devices were created, most of them were just sort of a one and done. We built a device, it's two or three terminals. We characterized it, and this is what it does, but they never really developed it beyond that initial device. Only the cryotron and the Josephson junction were ever actually developed beyond single devices. Now, since then, Josephson junctions have come to very much dominate the field because they're very good. They solve most problems. Um, they're, you know, the best magnetic field sensors around. You can use them as qubits, and in their single flux quantum uh, digital operation, they can actually do ultra-fast computing in the hundreds of gigahertz and run at ultra-low powers you know, in sort of sub joule territories. Now, that's not to say they're perfect, however. There are still some challenges that face Josephson junctions. Many of them have been dealt with, actually, but there are a couple sort of open questions that remain. And now, the first of those challenges when you're running one of these implementations is fabrication, um, simply because a Josephson junction is typically a two superconductors separated by either an insulator or a normal uh, metal. And the key parameters of that device, of that Josephson junction, depend exponentially on this width of, of, the, of the barrier between them. But, you know, for the most part, we have that handled. We can make devices, uh, chips, and that kind of thing with tens of thousands of these Josephson junctions on there. So that's, we're pretty good at that. Now, the second sort of challenge facing Josephson junctions is the fact that they are really great magnetic field sensors. As a result, you can pick up magnetic field, even magnetic field that you don't necessarily want, like magnetic noise. But again, if we have an environment that we can properly shield these in, we're very, pretty good at shielding these things and, and then running their operation. One thing, however, that has still not been dealt with um, in a particularly satisfactory manner is certain applications, specifically those involving driving high impedance loads and fanning out to multiple devices. In the operation of single flux quantum based logic and other Josephson junctions sort of like digital logic and driving applications, it's very hard to have a single magnetic flux quanta drive you know, a kilo ohm or tens of kilo ohms or hundreds of kilo ohms or fan out to dozens of devices. So with that in mind, we sort of we've been developing the nano cryotron, which we hope is going to be a very complementary technology to Do Josephson junctions and be able to deal with some of these problems or in some of these environments that Josephson junctions aren't applicable. Now, for basic understanding, the entron, or as we've been calling the nano cryotron, the entron is very similar to the cryotron insofar as where the cryotron worked by inducing this magnetic field and that magnetic field suppressed superconductivity, um, the entron differs in that it creates an electrothermal effect to suppress superconductivity. And the way this works is if we have a, drive a little bit too much current into a narrow channel um, that you can see here on the right, then we'll end up with a resistive, uh, then we'll break down superconductivity in that narrow channel and we'll end up with a small resistive normal region sort of hot spot that's self-heating. What's interesting about this though is that energy will actually bleed out of that hot spot. So even if that hot spot is very small, it looks like you've induced this, only this small effect by inputting this current, 
energy has been bleeding into hundreds of nanometers around it, and a, as a result, it can actually impact a very large area of our superconductor. Now, we built a geometry around this effect to actually exploit it. And what you see here are sort of the three terminals in the uh, device diagram, where you have a drain, a source, and a gate. Um, and specifically, the area that the hotspot is created is in this choke region that, I, that was illuminated in the last slide. Now, when the choke hotspot is created, it affects, um, the hot, it affects the superconductivity in the channel. And I'm going to show you how that is exactly in the next steps. So let's say we have a simple setup. We want to operate this nanocryotron as a, a current comparator. Or, so we want to see whether an input will generate an output on our load. So at the very beginning, everything's cold. Our device is fully superconducting. And any current dropped, all the current that's biased in through the top is actually going to go straight through to ground. Now, if we add a little bit of current to the gate, like I've mentioned before, that choke is very narrow, and that current will overwhelm the superconductivity in that small region. It'll exceed the critical current of the choke. And as a result, you'll get this gate-induced hotspot. It's very small. And as you can see, it doesn't look like it's really doing quite a lot. But keep in mind, like I said before, there's this electrothermal suppression effect where there's actually a very large radius of suppression around that hotspot. And as a result, the amount of current that the channel can actually carry has been significantly re reduced. Now, because that uh, the channel I see has been dropped, it actually a resistive strip will form in the channel because now the, the channel can no longer carry all of the bias current anymore. So you get this resistive strip. This res resistive strip continues to grow. And at the end of the day, you end up with current into your load. So you've got a digital comparator. You've, you know, with no current in, you get no current out. With some current in, you get an, uh, a current out. And then specifically, we get an amplified current out in our case. Now, what's really neat about this electrothermal suppression effect is that if you wanted to operate this device as a digital one, um, you need to have a sort of large switching characteristic, something, something, some small perturbation you can induce that will create a large change in the output so that you can have a digital like you know, feed forward and this kind of thing. And that's what the electrothermal suppression effect does exactly. If we look at the graph on the right, we can actually see that when we input different amounts of current into the gate, it changes the IV curve of the device very drastically. With zero microamps of input, when we don't have any input current into the gate, we can get about 100 microamps um, through there through the channel. And when we have, if we have put two microamps into the gate, we can get about the same amount. But if we add just two more microamps to the gate, then we see that the channel is only able to, as the ability for the channel to carry current is dropped by 30 or 40 percent. What's actually extra interesting about this is because we're making these devices on thin, very resistive films, and the hotspot can grow to a, basically arbitrarily large sizes, we can actually create very, very large voltages uh, in the, in the fi you know, several, several volt range, essentially. Now, without going into too much of the details, we actually tested one of these uh, digital comparators that I was demonstrating before. And for one of the, one of the devices we found, so we, we increased the gate until we saw that hot spot and we saw that switching effect again and again and again. And what we saw was that we had a median or like a, basically an average uh, gate current that we needed to induce that hotspot of about 2.9 microamps, um, which is fairly low because it got us, you know, probably 50 or 60 microamps out, which was nice. But what's really interesting about this especially is that when we repeated this 10,000 times, we saw that the distribution was only 66 nanoamps wide. And what this tells us essentially, it gives us hope that that sensitivity means that it, it will be sensitive to a single flux quantum input. If we, if we add a little flux onto a loop comprised of the gate and the entron, hopefully we can actually create this very large output. And so we think it'll be really a nice complementary integration with the, um, using the entron as a high impedance element and the ultra-fast and ultra-low power Josephson junctions as doing the computing and logic. Now, I want to really emphasize here how the entron fabrication is done because it, 
It's very, very, very simple. At the end of the day, it's really just three steps. You put a thin film down. It doesn't really matter how thick, as long as it's less than a diffusion length thick. You pattern some, uh, some resist with the, whatever method you want, in our case, E-beam, and then you etch the stuff away. And so the SEM you're looking at, the scanning electron micrograph you're looking at on the right, is actually a single contiguous film. There are no oxide barriers. There are no tunnel junctions of any kind. There's no gaps, nothing. It's just a metal film that's been patterned into this, what you see before you. Um, so because this is an electrothermal effect, and specifically a thermal effect, we do expect there to be some timing limitations. And so we took a look at sort of what those limitations would be for uh, the material that we're currently using, which is niobium nitride. And we sort of see a similar speed outlook to what we get out of our single photon detectors that are similarly made on the same material. And we sort of see this as about a one gigahertz outlook. So significantly slower than Josephson junctions, but it's, keep in mind it's serving a very different purpose here. And at the same time, that one gigahertz is a repetition rate. It's not necessarily the be all end all of performance. We're going to be getting a very fast rising edge on the order of 100 picoseconds or less and very low jitter out of these devices as well. Now, like I said before, many of these devices sort of came along and were characterized, and at the end of the day, we just said, okay, they were good in this way or that way, and you know, people should use them. So we wanted to take a step further. We wanted to really show that entrons were, you know, making simple circuits out of entrons was easy, and they were easy to apply, and there were many applications which we could do it on. And so we picked two, two um, relatively straightforward ones from our end, and sort of just apply them right away. The first one was our group does a lot of work with single photon detectors. And without getting into the details of that necessarily, essentially what the single photon detectors do is produce a pulse, a very, very small pulse that's hard to read out. And so we thought, well, the entron can carry a lot of current, so why don't we have that pulse go into the entron and have the entron pul uh, create a larger pulse, and then we'll be able to read the larger pulse out. And so we did that. And at the end of the day, we were able to have these two coax lines going into the doer and with this monolithically integrated, just pattern a single E-beam step, um, single photon detector and Entron, like digital comparator slash pulse amplifier. Now, what's interesting is because we had two coax lines reading these things out and powering and, and supplying current to them at the same time, we were able to get concurrent pulses out of them um, as well. And as a result, we were able to measure, directly compare the jitter of, of, of each of them. So jitter is very important for our single photon detectors. So we measured the jitter of this single photon detector, and it was about 41 picoseconds, which is not you know, the highest ever, but it's a fairly decent jitter. And when we measured the jitter of the entron pulse, we saw that it was significantly reduced down to 24 picoseconds. Now, certainly the entron isn't reducing timing uncertainty. It's not removing uncertainty from the system. That's sort of ridiculous to imagine. But what it is doing is it's creating a much larger pulse, having a much higher slew rate, and sort of neglect or sort of uh, pushing back the effect of noise on the jitter that you normally see. And so you end up reading out a lower jitter um, from the entron pulse because the amplitude of its pulse is much higher. And what's really more interesting about this from the Entron's point of view is that this really set an upper limit to the maximum jitter of the Entron. Um, SNSPD is just as a you know, regular function. State-of-the-art ones have jitters on the order of uh, you know, 20 picoseconds or so. And so the Entron certainly cannot have a jitter greater than 23.8 picoseconds as demonstrated here, but we're guessing it's actually significantly lower as well um, because the SNSPD is probably making up the main component of that. Now the second application, that was sort of an almost analog one, is, was to create some digital logic out of the Entron and sort of apply it in that way and show that it, we could make basic circuits out of this in, um, in case you, you know, needed to or you wanted to do some basic logic on a room temperature interface with the Entron and might see how easy it would be. And we were able to set, create a set of universal gates, uh, copy and or and not gate. Um, you can read about how they work in the paper listed in the bottom left corner. But for the moment, I'll just show you the diagrams. Um, with that digital logic, we then took it another step and actually implemented a half adder. Using about 14 of these entrons, we were able to build a nice little half adder that had, uh, at, 
you know, you can actually see it has a fan out of three just at the very beginning, which is very easy to implement. And we were able to add one plus one um, at a fairly slow rate because of our custom uh, electronics little rig. But nevertheless, it, it was able to very consistently add zero plus zero, zero plus one, one plus one, et cetera. Now, where do we go with this? We're really hoping to apply this in quite a lot of places, actually. Um, there's a lot of interesting applications just in this single flux quantum computing world where we could help out with low power processing, you know, driving, you know, memory modules might have a very long inductive line that needs to be driven, and it's very hard to do that with single flux quantum. So maybe we could use the single flux quantum to drive our Entron and, drive, and use the Entron to drive the memory modules or make line drivers out of them. We're also currently working to implement them with electro-optic modulators to operate at low temperature on photonic uh, waveguide circuits. Um, we're additionally using them to multiplex these single photon detectors, these SNSPDs, and hopefully read out several of them at a time. And certainly we're looking at different materials because, like we said, those timing limitations were, like, one gigahertz isn't exactly groundbreaking, but we believe other materials may hold the key towards um, raising that number up. Um, I'd like to thank all of our, our sponsors, our, obviously uh, uh, Professor Carl Bergen as well and my colleagues and also um, Jim Daly and Mark Mondel at the Nanostructures Laboratory at M MIT. And um, thank you.